everybody, and welcome back to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis. And I'm Greg, and it's the best dead gum garden show on the radio. That's right. We're really excited to have and you And the with internet. Us. Oh, I didn't know you weren't done. Yeah, in, in the internet. I in the internet. internet. Yeah. So we're really excited to have you with us tonight, whether you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, or listening to us via the podcast. We've got a really good show planned. We're going to be talking to some FAQs about drip irrigation tonight because it's that time where people are getting their drip irrigation in the ground and getting stuff planted or getting ready to plant stuff. Yeah, I got some buddies of mine, including me, to start to shake a lot on these pretty sunny days out there. I got a buddy that called me the other night, and it was at night time, and he was texting me, telling me what I was had doing his garden. I got to get my drip tape out Saturday. I got to do that. I said, yeah, me too. But it's causing some it's causing some insecurities right now with this pretty weather going on and people are maybe not up to date as they think they should be on their planting schedule. Yeah. And they're getting a little bit behind and they're getting a little, you know, getting that uneasy feeling. A lot there. of FOMO going FOMO, on. FOMO. Yeah. A lot of FOMO going on out yeah, there. I got a little bit of it myself. You got, I mm. can tell. I can tell. Yeah, I'm a little behind. I mean, I was behind on my potatoes. I'm behind. I feel like I'm a little behind on my corn, but I really don't think I am. But I'm a little bit behind in the greenhouse, but everything's going to be okay. Well, my taters are looking pretty. Almost, I think the Kennebecs are the last ones to come up. Uh, they're just now breaking the ground, but most everything I got full rows, uh, looking good. I've been giving them a little bit of splash, splash. for the overhead sprinkler, a little bit yeah. here and there. I'm about a week behind you. Waiting on my corn because I'm planting a super sweet. I was waiting on that soil temp to warm up a little bit, and uh, my buddy Lynn. Down the road from me, we planted some of that glacial over there at his place. He's already planted his silver queen. And um, I told him, let's wait several weeks after that silver queen and plant the glacial. Um, that way we don't cross pollinate and everything. Yep. Another one of our test gardeners, Mr. Andy Webb, Mr. Andy Webb called me the other night. Late, late, in the afternoon, you know? late in the afternoon, we won't talk gardening. And he said he was going to wait a little bit on that because he was afraid of the heat units also. So he's going to wait until it warms up a little bit more to get his in the ground. But Andy's all hyped up. I'm talking about bad hyped up. He's got each and he's shaking all over. He starts talking about gardening. He just gets all excited. Bless yeah. his heart. And we hopefully they're going to share a ear too oh, with yeah. us so we can so. try it out. My Yellowstone, I got my corn plot ready. I'm just um, waiting for the soil temp to warm up just another hair, and we're going to get it in the ground. My seedless watermelons, um, mm. I think I got to retry something there. Uh, some of them came up in the seed trays, but not as good as I want them to come up. And I think I'm going to try a little trick. A, a guy commented on one of the greenhouse videos I did and said this. So I think I'm going to replant them, and I'm going to cover the whole tray with saran wrap. Really? Um, I got some insights I can give you He said that. They, I may have got them too wet there. And I also think a couple of them random cool spells we had may have threw things I off. I think it probably so did. So I might have gotten a little bit of hurry. And the moisture might have been the thing. So I think I'm going to redo it, wet it down good, and I'm going to wrap the whole thing in saran wrap and uh, and try that. Well, when we get on that subject in just a little bit, I may have some insights on that. How about okay. that? Okay. Um, so this past weekend, I was on the road. Me and my family were on the road with our pop-up camper. We went to Pine Mountain, Georgia, the FDR State Park. And if, if you haven't subscribed to our pop-up channel, I'll put a link to that below. Make sure you go check that out. You still haven't subscribed to my pop-up channel. And the reason being is because I have to work. I have to work six to seven days a week to make sure everything goes smoothly around here. Folks, want folks, some folks is off camping, enjoying the world. Other folks are here in the daily grind, and that would be me, Greg. Mm -hmm. And I don't have time to subscribe to certain stuff that people are doing out there. It's all, I quit yeah. school because I didn't like recess. I just don't, I guess, work for me. Just work. Work. Just work. I like to sit by the fire with my laptop. It would be and, nice, but. And uh, do my work that yeah, way. Let's move on. On the way to Pine Mountain, I stopped at a store there in a wonderful town of Leesburg, Georgia. Uh, and when I go to these old country stores, I, that's where I get the shakes. I'm bad about these novelty hot sauces, barbecue sauce. I buy a different barbecue sauce every time I go in there or a different hot sauce, and then I, I they had a whole section of pickled okra. Mm -mm. Now, the problem is they misspelled it on these jars here. Oh, really? They misspelled okra. You see right there? Yeah. But I got two different kinds. Now, this kind, that fella, I think he's from Blackshear, Georgia, uh, gave us some of this one time. We tried that. We did. But I haven't tried the uh, salt. Well, show everybody there. what that looks like. What do you mean? The label. The, uh, that's the Wickles Wicked Okra. 
and this is the Salt Lake Oakery brand. They're both hot oakries. Mm. We're going to uh, we'll see which one we like better here. You know what? Speaking of convenience stores, mm. what about Bucky's up there in Warner Robins, George? I haven't been in that thing, but we got a fellow that works here. I have been in it. Have you? We got a fellow that, that went in there and he bought him a shirt. He says it's really something. Yeah. Now, we, we used to travel to Texas for a trade show. We saw them, but we couldn't go in one because we had that big trailer and couldn't get in there. But yeah, I have stopped at the Warner Warner Robins. You Anything you want to do in there, you can eat lunch, you get anything you need, buy a deer stand, corn feeder. Um, you get pretty much anything you need. A uh, fellow said that he stopped there and got $75 worth of gas and bought $90 worth of snacks. <laughs> <laughs> so, pretty much the case with that, ain't it? Yeah. I think they, they really entice you with those snacks in there. I think that one's got a little more, Wickle's got a little more kick to it than the Salt Lick. But I could be wrong. That's a different kind of oakery right there than that. That looks like uh, Clemson's finest oakery. That's got some sugar in it. That's got a sweet taste to that right there. Ooh. That looks like Clemson's finest oakery. That looks more like some jambalaya oakery right That's there. That's pretty good. It? Ooh, they need a little more. Mm. I'd probably pick this one. That one's got some complex flavors over there, but this is one you can sit down with your pack of Ritz crackers or some saltines and just go to town. Did you on. say complex? Complex. Complex. Complex flavor. So we got that to snack on. Speaking of okri, which one you want? You can put take one. Over right, there. I got a whole tray of my okri coming up here and get it out. So. You've watched a lot of our videos, you know we like to transplant our okra in the spring just to get a head start on it. And I can't remember what I put. Jing orange. Um, I'm going to plant Jing orange this year. Reason being is I never plant Jing orange before. Perkins, and uh, emerald green velvet. We've got pretty good germination on there. I did not soak these seeds. A lot of people do soak their okra seeds. We just put them in the tray and let them go. And um, these things really don't take long to grow off. I think I planted these a week or so ago. And I would say another two weeks, they'll be ready. The ground ought to be good and warm by then. Yeah, and the one thing I will tell folks, and we've talked about this several times, is don't get in no big hurry planting your okra because it does not like cool mm -hmm. soils. Now, you got lucky here. We had some cool nights, and you still got good germination. Somebody ain't been tending like that. Because I, I tended to them like I do. You know what I mean? Put the mojo on them and everything. But for the average person, these right here do not like cool soils, and they don't like cool nights to germinate. So... Wait on your okra till it warms up. Be one of the last things that you plant in your garden, and you'll get a lot better germination. If you plant these transplants, if you try to plant them too soon in cool soils, you will lose about half of them. Yeah, they get stunted I, as I well. I have had that happen Yes, you before. have. Um, so you, you got to be patient with your okra. Yep. Speaking of, of germination and everything, uh, my buddy Wes over at the Naked Hog Channel we, we we had talked had a conversation about this when he was down visiting us, and then he went home and made it happen. So he created his own little germination chamber, and you need to go over to his channel and watch the video or videos he's been doing on that. He's been getting just amazing germination times, getting peppers up in three days, crazy stuff. But if anybody, if you've got an old deep freezer that don't work or old refrigerator that don't work, any kind of contained box like that that is somewhat insulated you can create one of these homemade germination chambers and uh you just have to have some kind of heat source in there and he's wrapping them with saran wrap putting them in there and getting really good germination rates and just incredible germination time so go over the naked hog channel yep and watch how he did it i, I think anybody could do it the, I, I went and looked at it the actual uh video on the thumbnail doesn't say anything about germination chamber it talks about how well he got his peppers to germinate and it goes into the, the germination chamber there now wes didn't invent this germination chamber no. but he did a good job there's several of them out on the internet showing how to do this he took an idea and ran he did it. a great job with it, the way he set it up and i was going to do me one last year it was on my to-do list and lots more things never got around to it but they do work well. Now, I happen to be privy to some information here about germination chambers. Okay. Probably the largest vegetable greenhouse operation here in the southeastern United States. The guy that's over all that, he and I, proper English here, he and I had some conversation about this. Because I have been down there and seen their germination chamber. It's this huge room that they have spray foamed. 
And what they do is they take these exact trays right here, and after they seed them in water, they stack them, stack them on a pallet and they wrap them with saran wrap. Well, not actually saran wrap, but pallet wrapping. Mm -hmm. wrapping. It's the same thing, but it's just a commercial thing. They wrap them with that and they stick them in the germination chamber. Mm -hmm. Now, this germination chamber is 85 degrees at 100% humidity. Everything stays nice and moist. They leave the hot peppers in there for three days. You'll find this interesting. They leave the bell pepper in there for five days and they leave tomatoes in there for three days. They pull them out and go directly into the, the greenhouse, put them on the shelves. They get 99 to 100% germination on just about everything, but it is a controlled environment there at that first germination sh uh, stage that causes the success with the germination. And I feel like that's where a lot of people fail at, you know, when they're trying to plant and put it in a greenhouse, whatever, you have a couple of those cool nights or everything's not ideal and you'll get some germination that's spotty. Some stuff don't come up. Well, it's not always bad seed. Sometimes it's just a bad environment for germination. And we know peppers are temperamental for, you know, getting them germinated. Mm -hmm. But I thought I'd share that. That's how they do it. I've seen small farmers take these shipping containers and do the same thing. But that's pretty much the way it is. 85 degrees and 100% humidity and then bound inside that plastic so that, humid, that moisture can't go anywhere. Yeah, even in our greenhouse, which most would consider a controlled environment, we usually let these trays hang off the end of the, the, the heat mats a little bit, and it's usually not an issue, but these random cold spills we had, you can tell every one of our trays, things are slow on the end here from where we had them hanging off. Usually it's not an issue, and we don't worry about it. That's why we put them up there like that, just because we can fit more trays on the mat. But this year, with these random cold spells, you can see on the end of this one. Yeah, and, one. and believe it or not, I've had one tray out there where we actually lost those seeds. Now, I know it was good seeds because everything else germinated, but the ones on the end stayed off from that heat for so long, the seeds actually deteriorated beyond point of being able to germinate. That's right. That's so, right. So go to Wes's channel, watch that video. If you can find your old deep freezer or refrigerator, make you one of those. And uh, I like Wes, but if he can do it, Anybody can do it. I do too. He, I mean, you find you one of those crop box at the yard sale. Don't go buy no new ones. You find you one your aunt, your mama's got, or somebody, or somebody's got a old crop pot laying around, or flea market, or whatever, and buy you one. All you gonna do is boil water in it. That's right. Uh, I mentioned Wes's channel, Mama J, who's a loyal viewer of our show. Mama J's got her own YouTube channel called Mama J's Country Gardening, and Mama J wanted us to tell everybody to go subscribe to her channel. And, uh, She's just getting started, but not only does she do gardening, she does some cooking. Cooking, that's right. And um, I can tell you from experience, having two YouTube channels, that uh, the first thousand subscribers are the harder to get, hardest to get, and uh, hardest to get some momentum there. So do us all a favor. Go over there, subscribe to Mama J's channel there, and help her get started on YouTube because she's got some good content that I think everybody would like to see. And she she appears to me. I bet she can do some fine cooking. Yeah, yeah. She's got some experience underneath the She made the belt. That, uh, that hot sauce she made was yep. pretty good stuff. Yep. What else we got going on? Uh, a little reminder about our giant pumpkin growing contest. So we um, that's underway. Most people are just now starting their transplants. Mine are up, but certainly not ready to go in the ground. Uh, just the basic rules there. You got to grow one of our four giant varieties. Prize winner, Atlantic Giant. Mammoth Gold or Big Max, you got to figure out figure out a, to, a way to weigh it. Uh, that was tough on you, wasn't it? Up there. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people said, well, that's not fair. I don't have a forklift, whatever. I don't have a forklift either. So I think that's going to be the fun part is everybody trying to figure out a way to get an official weight on this thing. So you got to weigh it. Take a picture. Anytime you're showing any progress with your pumpkin crops, uh, use the hashtag Hoss Pumpkin Boss. And make sure to tag um, our buddy Aaron over at Four Kids at a Farm. He did an announcement video on his channel, and he's going to be kind of helping us out with that, keeping up with the results. So uh, grab your giant pumpkin seed if you haven't already. I think this is going to be fun. The good thing about the giant pumpkins is a lot of people think, well, I don't have enough room to grow giant pumpkins. But the, the strategy with growing them is that you kind of cull them back to just one or two per vine. So if you had a raised bed and you got that pumpkin sitting in that one bed, 
You could just baby that one pumpkin. Oh, yeah. I think it's fun. They're fun to grow. I hadn't done it in a while, but I've done it in the past. That, it might be advantageous to actually have it in a raised bed. You could get hold to it better. I've seen people even put them on pallets and stuff. You know, a carpet. I think I may have done that one time. Put some old carpet down. You, and you build a, a top of the Man, I got, I got carried. I got carried away. I got carried away. Mm. Anyway, so y'all get you some giant pumpkin seeds. That should be fun for everybody. Somebody was talking about, was it you talking about giving them milk? What me? Somebody on the row by row Facebook group, I think. Now milk right. is has some fertility qualities to it. Yeah. So you got some milk that goes bad drizzling on the pump. Well, actually, I knew a guy that was in dairy business one time, and if they ever had milk go by, they spread it on the pastures because it did help. So, oh yeah. 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 Get the grass going. Last thing before we get into drip irrigation, a few new varieties to mention uh, that we just added. These are bean varieties. So the first one here is a popular one, uh, and we were excited to get it added to the lineup. This is your top crop bush bean, really productive bush bean. You're going to get a lot of production on the top of the plants there and uh, make those easy to pick. So we got that one. And let me expand on that just sure. a minute. That is a 1950 All-American Selection winner. So it's been around for quite a while. It is classified as an heirloom uh, variety. And for people that uh, want to grow them a little crop of bush beans, I think this would be a great one. It's an heirloom. You can save the seeds if you if that be your thing. That's right. You can plant them pretty thick, double rows if you want to. 1950. That's a little longer than what we've been around. Yeah. Yeah. Not much longer than you, but... Uh, well, easy. Easy now. Uh, and then the other one we got here is an old favorite. A lot of people love the Blue Lake. I think this 274 or something bush bean. We got the blue light pole bean in as well. Uh, so excited to have these because rattlesnake beans are a little short. Mm -hmm. So we wanted to make sure we had some pole beans, even though it might not be the exact variety somebody was looking for. But now that blue lake is one that's been around for a while too. And everybody loves to flavor the blue lake, blue lake, blue lake. bush bean. Now they have that same quality in the pole bean. And this is a stringless variety as well. It being a pole bean, it is ideal for you all out there that's got those small backyard patios or garden spaces and want to grow you some beans. If you ain't got much room, you can do it vertically with the Blue Lake pole bean. That's a fine cannon bean right yes, there. Yes, it too. is. All it's right. a dark green bean with a white seed in it. That's right. Now to our main topic tonight. We're going to be talking about drip irrigation. I feel like we do three or four shows a year on drip irrigation and the reason for that is this is probably, of all of our product lines, the one that we get the most questions asked about. And, and people are scared of, of it, nervous of it, and it's really simple. So tonight we want to take the opportunity to just go through, I don't know how many I got here, 11 or 12 frequently asked questions about drip irrigation, kind of knock those out and um, address some some lingering issues people have been asking, how to put it on raised beds, stuff like that. Now, earlier this week... Uh, I don't ever eat the top of the okra. I, I do. I just, I peel, I don't know what it is, but I don't like to eat it. I just, I, I just gnaw that off and put it back. Yep. Earlier this week... Anyhow, go ahead. <laughs> earlier this week, on Tuesday, I had a video come out talking about the top five reasons you should be using drip irrigation in your vegetable garden, and uh, you can go check that out. On our YouTube channel, we talked about on that video, you're going to use less water. You're going to have to run your water for a shorter amount of time. Mm -hmm. You're going to have less weeds because you're not watering between right. rows. You're going to have less diseases because you're reducing plant moisture, and it's going to make it easier to feed your plants. I got one more throw in there. So this year, I'm growing some of those varieties. That we're not, I'm, I may be just planting. I think I got two better boys. I got two lemon boys. I'm growing a couple of these different varieties in my garden to trial out. They're coming in in my greenhouse at different times, so I may not plant but five tomatoes. So what I did is I went out in my garden and I planted me a little small row of five tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Well, I said, you know, that ain't enough for me to put drip tape down on, so I'm just going to overhead water them. I'm amazed at the time I have spent overhead water them. The time issue is a huge one versus watering by hand and watering with drip tape. And I didn't, I knew that, but it didn't resonate with me again until I've gotten into it in the last couple of weeks. So being able to go out there and flip that vial and walk off and do something else and come back is a huge issue for me for my time management when I spend in the garden in the afternoon because I'm spending a lot of my time standing there 
Porter. Mm -hmm. You know, Hugh. So I, Hugh, yeah, you, yeah, uh, yeah, I know Hugh. <laughs> I did a uh, a little approximation on my video, and I was I took my tripod sprinkler, and just based on what I know the flow rate is for my well, I give it it. I I was a little lenient on the tripod sprinkler. I said, okay, let let's just figure this thing's putting out three gallons a minute. Okay, if I run that thing for two hours, I'm end up putting out. 360 gallons of water on one of my thousand square foot pots. 360 gallons of water running a tripod for two hours. Take that compared to running drip tape in my onion pot. I have 10 30 foot rows. That's 300 foot of tape. The output on our tape is 0.48, let's just say 0.5 gallons per minute per 100 feet. You do the quick math on that. If I run the drip tape for two hours, I'm using 160 gallons of water. If I run the overhead, I'm using 300 and uh, Three, I'm using twice as much water. Oh, that's close here. enough, yeah. I was better at doing the math on the video. I yeah. hung up here. Um, a lot more water. Yeah. Just say a lot more So twice water. as much water if you run them the same time. But then you figure that you're not running the drip for near as long. You're going to use even less water um, than you are the sprinkler. So yeah. for folks that live in the city, that... You know, they had to pay for the water. That makes That's a, a difference. huge difference. Yeah. And for even for us, you know, we had to pay the electric bill when we right. run a lot of water. So. Well, even, nobody wants to waste water. Right. I mean, it's a precious yeah, commodity I mean, we have. We don't want to waste water. I think everybody water. can agree on that. Oh, let's yeah. not waste yeah. a lot of water. Okay, so let's get into some FAQs about drip irrigation. Let's start with number one. A lot of people ask, does it work like a soaker hose? No. No, it does not work like a soaker hose. The water output is very consistent with drip tape. One thing that we always get questions of, people that's always used sucker hose in the past, is they, they're not consistent getting water out there. You hook a sucker hose up, and you're gonna get a lot more water either at the end or the beginning and not near on the other end. So it's not consistent at all. And as it sits in the sun, it's gonna get some spots develop on it where you get a lot more water. Right, or get some of those pew, that come up there. Mm -hmm. It's just the nature of the product, okay? You go buy a, the best sucker hose they got, you're not going to get good results with it. With the drip tape, it is always consistent. The same thing at the very end emitter as it is the very first emitter. So you don't have to worry about being inconsistent water because it's the same all the way through, which is a huge issue. Yeah, and the, the drip tape, you pull out that roll there for me and unwrap that a little bit if you don't mind. With the drip tape, it's not like the sucker hose where water is kind of shooting out in all different directions with it. Water's just kind of seeping out of the top of these emitters over the top of the tape. There's a sticker on it right there. There you go. There you go. So this is our new tape we'll talk about in just a minute. But you've got your emitters here on these. It's got these little slits. There's one right there, one another 12 inches apart from that. So your tape, your water is just going to come out little droplets here because this is facing up and run over the sides. It's not shooting all over the place. It's a lot more controlled, consistent flow. Yep. And this deflates when it's not in use. Soaker right. hose does it. Yeah, you'll actually see the, the ground kind of expand just a little bit when you turn this thing on. You'll see, shh. Uh -huh. That's where your water going through there. And when you turn it off, it's just a gradual thing that goes back. And I don't know, uh, I don't know if soaker hose is recommended to be buried, but this is. We'll talk about that in a minute. So, um, I mentioned the output earlier. On this tape, it's 0.48 gallons per minute per 100 feet. You do the math on that, 0 0.0048 gallons per minute per emitter. Uh, so that gives you an idea of how much water you're putting out with this stuff. Number two, what are the pressure slash flow requirements? So, got this right here. So this is our filter regulator combo that starts the beginning of every drip system, um, your filter catches any hard minerals. You got to reduce the pressure down to 12 PSI, else you'll blow these lines out. So the, the main, um, let's say, I don't know what the word I'm looking for here. The main restrainer for the drip system would be this piece right here, as far as your flow rate goes. So a lot of people worry about pressure, but it's not really as much pressure as it is flow rate. This thing can take a flow rate from 0.5 to 8 gallons a minute. Now, my well is close to 8, but not quite 8. Yeah, and we had this conversation. I had it earlier today with a customer. Uh, most of the residential wells or city water is going to fall in those parameters of 50, 
40 to 50 PSI and up to eight gallons per minute. Now, there is exceptions to the rule. Sometimes people's got these huge wells and they pumping 15, 20 gallons per minute and maybe 80, 90 pounds of pressure. If you got that situation, you're gonna have to reduce a little bit to get in this because it will malfunction as some of those gallons per minute and even the pressure, in my opinion. So you, you're restricted about what you go here. Now, if you're, if you're eight gallons a minute or less, or what I say is 50, 60 pounds or less, you can go in this and it's going to reduce the pressure and the gallons per, well, it's not going to really mess with the gallons per minute, but it's going to work properly with the gallons per minute to make everything smooth. So between, you can figure out your flow rate easily, see how long it takes you to fill up a five gallon bucket. Between 0.5 and eight. If you've got over eight gallons a minute of flow, what you can do is put a ball valve on your spigot and dial it back a little bit. That's probably the easiest solution. Or if you just go out ready to speak it, you can just close it down some. Yeah. Now, if you got one of those unique situations where you got some very high pressure, I normally recommend people getting something, whether it be from your local plumbing shop or through the internet, to reduce that pressure down to 50, 60 pounds to go in this. Now, you read online where that can handle up to 90 pounds. I, I thought I read. You made me doubt what I read, but I'm pretty sure. Well, I, I always read that. tell people 50 to 60 pounds is as much pressure as you want to go in there. Look here, at 90 pounds of pressure, you can blow the world up. You can blow all this. I've seen PVC blow up at 90 pounds of pressure. My wells are set between 45 and 50. Which is ideal. So if you yeah. got 90 pounds of pressure or 85, I would personally suggest you getting it down to the 50 range to go in this right here. Cause a lot less issues for you. Yeah. And, and it's plenty anyway. And we designed this whole setup. That's why we go ahead and put it together for you. We designed this because it's going to fit within most backyard gardeners' parameters, whether you're on city water or got your own yep. well. All right. Number three, how big of a system can I run at a time? Well, that's all according to how much gallons per minute you have at a time. What restricts you is what you've got going into it. Remind me to get to them earlier. I forgot mm -mm. They look a lot better than mine. Did you uh, grow those? I might have. So our mainline tubing here, I'll get, over, I'll get to this setup in a minute. Our mainline tubing that we use, which is a half inch inner diameter, five eighths outer diameter. Um, this particular mainline tubing will support row lengths up to 100 feet. That means the tape. tape running that direction. Perpendicular to the mainline. Yeah. It can be as long as 100 feet. Now, you can go to bigger mainlines and go for longer rows, but the system we carry, you restricted a row 100 feet. Now, there's two things you can get around doing that. If you got longer than a 100-foot row, you can either go down to that 100 foot, run you another lateral mainline there, or... Just simply go to the end of the road. If you're less than 200 feet, run you 100 foot back this way and run 100 foot to that yeah. way, and you got 200 foot. Yeah, instead of feeding your garden from one side, split it down the middle, and you can run row, rows. Or feed from each end, 200 feet regardless. So 100 foot row length is the max for the main line. As far as how much tape you can run at a time, the basic um, calculation here is per one gallon of flow rate, you're going to be able to support 250 feet of tape. Um, so for every gallon you have, uh, I have around eight gallons a minute, so I can support eight times 250 at a time. And if you have, you don't have enough water for all the tape you got run, you can set it up in sections. Uh, you can put valves on the rows, lots of different things you can do, but 250 feet of tape per one gallon flow rate. Um, what you need to know. So if you have five gallons, which is a normal, I would say normal that what people got is five gallons per minute, you run a thousand feet. 1250. Yep. Yeah. So you got plenty of water for, that's a big garden. Mm -hmm. Number four, can I use this with a gravity fed system? We get this question a lot. Yep. And I've had a viewer a time or two say, I had no problem running it with my gravity fed system. But all the research I read out there says, you got to get those tanks pretty high off the ground to generate enough pressure uh, to go. You want you want to be kicking at least uh, on a minimum about 15 psi uh, to this uh, filter regulator combo here to get your drip system going good. You mentioned the max pressure, but you want to have a brown at least 15 psi going in, mm -hmm. which is not very high pressure, but you need at least that much. Now I was reading um, some calculations online. And it said that for every 10 feet of elevation, you achieve about 4.3 to 4.5 PSI. So 
to get up to that 15, you had to put that tank about 35 feet off the ground. Which is not feasible for most people. Yeah, unless you put it on top of your house or on top of your barn. Right. Now, I'm not saying it can't be done. And I've heard of folks saying they have done it, but you need to be able to generate about 15 pounds of pressure. Number five, how deep can it be buried? You want to take care of this one? Up to six inches. Now, some people will lay it on top of the ground. I've seen that done before, but it was designed and it works best if it's buried a little bit. Now, I normally put mine about two inches somewhere in there. You ain't got to get caught up. It ain't going to be exact. Up to six inches. I think three inches, two, three inches is a sweet spot there. And you can lay it underneath there. It keeps it out of sight, out of mind. Plus, in varmints and moles and rats, whatever, if they get thirsty, they ain't going to get into it. Yeah, you want it deep enough to where uh, it's going to feed your plant roots good, but also I like it, you know, three, four inches deep so I can take my single tine and just kind of graze over the top of the soil and I don't have to worry about getting into it. Another thing we get a lot of, people want to irrigate out of a pond or a stream using a drip irrigation. I had uh, one just today again, and the guy was talking about he had this big pond, and I said, you know, it's possible, but you have to use this elaborate sand filter system because all those great nutrients that you got in that pond that you want to put in your garden will also stop up the emitters. So you, you, while it is possible to use a surface water, you really have to dig down and put your pretty nice sand filter system in to filter out all those sand particles or anything that will stop you from your emitters. It was designed to run off well water. But if you can get a good enough filter, feeding it with pond water would be pretty good stuff yeah, for the garden. And it is possible. Uh, number six, are the holes pre-punched or do you have to punch the holes? So like we mentioned earlier, the holes on our tape are 12 inches apart. They are pre-punched. You can find tape out there with eight inch emitter spacing, six inch emitter spacing, but the standard is 12 inches. The commercial guys that are all around here where they're growing watermelons, peppers, tomatoes, Regardless of their plant spacing, they all use 12 inch. Tape. A lot of people get hung up on the 12 inch spacing. It bothers them a lot. And I tell them, look here, all it's got to do is wick out six inches each soil. So if you, even if you don't plant on the emitter, which I normally try to do if I'm doing transplants, and you plant it in the middle there, all you got to do is leave it on long enough so that it wicks out six inches and it'll catch that one. You'll be yeah. fine. If the water wasn't adequate enough, when I bury this and plant corn on top of it, I would see variable germination where the emitters are located and that's not what i see at all no. all my corn comes up at the same time uh pretty nicely so don't get hung up on the emitter spacing if it doesn't work perfect for whatever plant spacing you're doing and other people wanted to know well i'm putting tomatoes on two or three foot can i plug these holes in the middle here no you can't but you're still going to be using less yeah. water than if you were doing it over And your tomatoes are going to grow roots out far enough to catch that and utilize that moisture anyway. Now, if you're growing a smaller garden and you're putting stuff three, four feet apart and and you, you really hung up on that spacing, I would highly recommend going with something like our container gardening kit where you basically have the main line here and you punch the drippers or emitters wherever you want them. So... If you don't want water every foot and you want water every four or five feet, that container watering kit is a much better option for you. You can put the emitters wherever you want them. You know, raised beds, a lot of people nowadays are wanting to use drip irrigation raised beds. It only makes sense because we've seen how successful we've been using it in you know, the ground. And with water like it is, using this in a raised bed is a great option. However, it does cause some problems in the design aspect of it because we designed all this as our kit for a lay flat garden. It can be done in raised beds, but you got to think a little different. Am I correct? Yeah, I'm about to blow, you, blow some minds about here. Blow some minds. that out the way for me. So I actually had a lady email me the other day and um, she sent me a drawing of her garden and I, uh, I pulled it up on my computer and I drawed on it a little bit and sent it back to her. And I had never really thought about it a whole lot until I saw her design. It, you know, made me scratch my head a little bit. But I figured out, I think, the best way to do it on a raised bed. I'm going to show you two different ways. You can go with whichever one you want. Uh, it does require a few extra fittings, but I think once you have it in place, you really, you know, you, you got it. So let's go off. Well, let's go with this design here first. So hold that in down. And uh, y'all just use your imagination here with me a little bit. And I know this is not perfectly straight so to do a drip irrigation system for raised beds we're assuming you got raised beds in a row you know they're all kind of lined up 
You're going to have to rerun your mainline tubing along the ground, just like you would for an in-ground garden. But when you get to that raised bed, assuming it may be a foot, could be four foot off the ground, three foot off the ground, two foot, whatever, you're going to have to get your water supply or your main line up to the top of that bed. So one way to do it would be to just run over the top of the bed. So imagine this space right here is your raised bed. You have your main line tubing running along the ground. You might want to bury that so you don't trip over it. When you get to your bed, the start of it, you go up, use an elbow to go up, use an elbow to go over, elbow back down, and elbow here. So you would need four elbows per bed. But once you've got this set up, then you can plug, get a row start. You basically plug your drip lines in here, one, two, three drip lines, whatever you need. That's going to run the length of your bed, and you got it. So this would take a little more work to set up initially, but this mainline tube can last and last. So this would be the header part of your raised bed that runs the complete width of the raised yeah, bed yeah. there, and you could put as many row starts in there as you like. So instead of putting the filter regulator combo at the beginning of the plot like we do, with a raised bed, you probably put the filter regulator at your spigot, or wherever you started your main line, and then you just run this to connect the beds and, and go up over the bed, back down, plug into it right yeah, there. That'll work. One more way to do it. You put that one to the side there. Here's one more option. So instead of going over the top of the bed, you kind of go to the side of the bed. So you still got your main line running along the ground. So if you had a raised bed on the end where you wanted to stop line, you could use this. You could use this, or you could use this instead of going all the way over the top like I did the other. This is going to use one less fitting, I think, because this uses one T, an elbow, and a, a figure eight end clamp. So this is running along the ground between your beds. When you get to the side of one of your beds, you use a T to come up, an elbow to run the main line across the width of the bed. Of course, you got to crimp that off with a figure eight and then show them where that is. Boom, anywhere boom. you want it to go right there. How about that? Yeah. I think the little horseshoe design I showed earlier is a little cleaner, a little neater than this. This does require a few less fittings. This is probably a little slightly cheaper option, but uh, it can easily be done. You just kind of need to draw it out, figure out what fittings you get. I yeah. always tell people, that are doing it, I say, you know, draw it out if you need to, but with our fast shipping, just buy the eight meal kit and then kind of get it all laid out and you'll see, okay, oh, I need six more tees, five more elbows. You order them, we'll ship them out the same day. Cause I'm here working while some people's off building fires. That's right. Okay. And I'll get your order out. All right, so that's how to do it on a raised bed. Another question we get as far as the raised beds, how many lines would you put? Most people have a four-foot wide raised bed. The reason most people have four-foot wide, I am trouble talking, Board. four-foot wide raised beds is because that is the optimal length for you to lean in and work is two foot. So if you lean in from two foot from one side or two foot from the other side, that's ideal. That's the reason you don't see six-foot raised beds out there. Well, you, you do six foot, you, you waste some board. Most people take a eight foot. Two well, that too, but then you're reaching in three foot, and that most people ain't got that to reach into and work and work soil. Yeah, their arms ain't long yeah. enough. So in a four foot bed, if I was just planting one row of squash, I'd do one line. But if I was planting um, a double row of peas or two rows of peas, I'd put two lines. If I was just filling it up with something like carrots or cutting come again greens. And, and the whole bed was going to be covered with plants, I think three lines would be sufficient to feed a four-foot bed. Yeah, you could do that. <clears throat> I'm, I have been pollinated this uh, these last couple of weeks. Yeah, you're doing better, though, ain't you? A little bit better. Okay. I sound better? You say, do you do, you do sound better? Uh, number 10, can it be reused? Of course, bring that back over here. You're you working me to death. I'm going to have to eat some okra. So can it be reused? We have the eight mil tape and we have the 15 mil tape. The eight mil tape, I'll get about three or four uses out of it before I'll hang it up. Let's see, if it starts getting a lot of holes in it, whether that be from me nicking it or something chewing into it or whatever, I'll usually retire that piece. But um, three to four uses out of it. You can save it from year to year if you don't grow year round like we do. I just use it from season to season and then retire it after um i'm tired of patching up a particular piece the 15 mil will last for several years i would tell you the 15 mil because it's twice as thick 
It's a little more rigid. It's a little harder to slip on. Where'd that roast start go right there? It's a little harder to slip on the roast starts, but it does last a lot longer. So the main thing is if you're growing vegetables, annuals, something that you just need for maybe a season or two, go with the eight mil. If you're doing perennial something, maybe three to five years or longer, go with the 15 mil. And don't vary from that. Stick to what I tell you. Yeah. 11, plant on top of it or plant to the side of it? Hmm. You can do both. You can. You can do both. With corn, we bury this. Just imagine it's buried three inches deep below the soil surface there, and we'll run our cedar and plant right on top of it. We'll do that with beans, other stuff. Um, for tomatoes, say like a big tomato transplant, you're going to pr probably plant it deeper than three inches, so you're actually going to the side of it because you think about your root ball going down here. So you can plant on top of it to the side. Uh, when we're doing double rows, we'll plant a few inches to each side of it. These things put out enough water to cover several inches on uh, both sides of the tape. Now, when I'm planting tomatoes, I plant on every other emitter. That's two foot space. And when I plant my peppers, I do every other emitter. That's two foot spacing as well. And I find that works really good as far as spacing goes. Yeah. Plant right there on that emitter, right beside it. I did my indeterminates on three foot because I'm using them cages and they take up a little more room. But on determinants with the weave, yeah, two foot all the time. Number 12, and this may be the one I've been seeing the most lately as far as our Facebook group goes, how long to run it? And this is not a, a easy question to answer. No, it's not. Because there's a lot of variables at play here. And what type of soil do you have? If you got sandy soils like ours, you're going to, have to run it more often than somebody with clay soils. Depends on what crop you're growing. What stage that crop is in? Well, if corn is tasseling out, it needs more water, has more water, water requirements at that point. Also going to depend on your plant spacing. You got stuff planted really intensely, you're going to need a lot more water out put there. Also depends on your temperature outside. Mm -hmm. You know, is it real hot yet or is yep. it still a little cool at night? There's a lot of people out there that's got to know all the answers before they use it. Yeah. And we get that. I mean, I, they're nice people, but they just want to beat a dead dog. You know what I mean? And yeah. I'm like, once you get it in the ground, believe it or not, it's going to come to you how long to leave it on. Yeah. It's going to come that's to you. I tell them. Just set it up. Set it up and let it and run. you can see, as soon as you turn it on, go out there 30 minutes later, you can see how far out that water has gotten. Yeah, and, uh, and it's going to come be, to you, and you're going to say that. Now, y'all all got that brother-in-law that's got to know everything before he does anything. He's going to research it. He's going to do his math and all that. Just chill out a little bit. It ain't that complicated. <laughs> you yeah. know what brother-in-law I'm talking about. Yeah, just yeah. turn it, hook it up, yeah. turn it on, and uh, you'll get a feel for it pretty dang quick. Yep. Last thing. The, uh, I, I, I can do it right here. So... Let me give a little demonstration on this because some people, um, they have trouble getting these on there just right. And then some people also, they get real upset if there's a little bit of drip going on between one of these connections here or at this connection here or at this in the main line. And you yep. got to remember, folks, this, this, we ain't, these ain't glued PVC pipe pieces. So you might get a little drip here and there. Uh, don't let it bother you or lose any sleep in that. No, but I'm going to give a little in, little insight right here. So you see this field right here? We have a lot of people that are having some leaking issues right there, and you can tell there's a gap there. Now, here's the deal on this right here. First of all, we got to check and make sure that water hose washer is in there. If you got that washer in there, what you have to do is you have to tighten this completely on your water hose so that it doesn't have that anymore, and that's the way it seals. So sometimes you may even have to put a couple of wrenches on there. But if you get it tight enough, what that does is pull that together right there and creates that seal and stops the leak. If it's leaking a lot, you've either cross-threaded it, don't have your washer there, or you don't have it tight enough. So that's an issue we hear right there sometimes. Now you should tell you, let me, let me expand on that real quick there. I've also noticed it can happen if you've got this thing kind of jacked up a little bit. So if you've got it sitting like this instead of laying on the ground, the water hose is coming off here. It's kind of putting this thing in a bent bind. If you'll turn it, lay it down so this thing isn't strained none, it'll stop leaking. Right. So another thing, uh, a lady was had bought two irrigation systems and two irrigation kits, and she put one in her house, and these work fine. She went and put it in at her daughter's house, and every one of them just poured out leaking. 
And she couldn't figure it out. Well, I couldn't either to start with. She sent me a video of it. And I was like, wow. She said, we're fine at my house. I said, well, make sure you cut a straight line, put your tape on there. And I went over all that with her. And she said she did. And then it dawned on me what it was. They had too much water supply. Uh -huh. So she was putting them on correctly, which is normally what I would say you didn't put them on correctly. But she was putting them on correctly, but she had too much water supply coming in here. Gallons a minute. And it was causing this to malfunction, and it was pushing the drip tape off these fittings here, causing them to leak. If you got more than eight gallons a minute, it's like this ain't even there. Yeah. A lot of people, when you have problems, first thing you want to do is we want to blame the equipment. But sometimes we have to look at it because we know the equipment works. We have to look at maybe did you put it on there right? And then we also look at was your input right on the water? If your input is right and you put it on there right, it's going to work like a charm. So let me see that way to start. So putting these on here is not too complicated, but there's kind of a little bit of an order of operations to it here. So you got the nut here that tightens down. First thing you'll do is back it all the way out. Slide your tape on there as far as on there as you can get and then give it a little twister brew okay then tighten it down with your nut right there it's one of those things where you could actually use another hand yep. if you was a three-handed person you'd and, be ideal. and it's good to test it just right. like that and then you just make a little hole yes you know, so i do it different from that i always punch my hole and put my roast oil in there first uh -huh. you can get the tape a lot tighter on there if you do it this way mm. trust me and you pop that in there. You want to make sure you hear that pop. If it don't pop, you, your hole ain't in there real good. Now, some people said these little roast starts here are stiff, a little stiff. And they are a little stiff. I don't use them that often. But uh, you, when you're turning these, you kind of want to grab the whole piece yep. here so you don't yank that out. But that is how you do that there. Um, the row ends really, really easy to install as well. Let me take this. I'll just here. cut your end off here. Yeah, I got, it, I got it right here. So this is just your end cap here. Some people will tie this in a knot, do all kinds of things. It doesn't get much easier than this little piece right here. You just stick it through this little hole, fold it a couple times. Boom, boom. There you go. And when you get ready to flush your system out, easy to take off. you just undo it, flush out, and then put it back. It's, man, that's just easy peasy, ain't it? That's just easy peasy. Last thing, let's talk about this new tape. So we've been showing it the whole show and kind of. Uh, so, so there's a little bit of an issue with getting stuff nowadays. We talked about that. There's some supply yeah. issues out there. And not only are there supply issues, most of these drip tape manufacturers are making things for the big farmers. They're making huge rolls that go on tractors. They're not. Uh, let me scoot this a little closer here. So their goal is, is really not to make these smaller rolls here. We have to get these smaller rolls specially made for us, for our kits, so we can make this type of product accessible to a backyard gardener. With that being said, we've had to switch tape manufacturers in the middle of the season to just so we could have the tape. So we went from the Rivulus tape to this Iritec tape here. There's not much difference to it at all. The Tape looks a little different, but it performs pretty much the same. The emitters are these little slits here as opposed to the round pinholes in the rivulus tape. You do have the green lines here, so you know you want the green lines facing upwards. You want the emitters facing upwards. And the flow rate is close to the rivulus. It's not much different yeah, so at all. The rivulus was 0.4 gallons per minute per 100 feet. This is 0.48. Um, this roll is a little smaller. I think this roll is uh, 1467, 1470. The other one was 1640, something like that. So a little bit different, but should perform exactly the same for you. Now, right over there. If you've got our drip tape layer, cover up my face here, but it'll be all right. If you've got our drip tape layer, and you're out of the rib, old rivulus tape that was that thing was kind of designed for and you need more tape, you can still use this roll. It is a good bit, I'm gonna say a good bit, it is narrower than that other roll. So we had to make some modifications so it will fit with it. We got these little things here we call- Adapters. EarTech axle spacers. They're on our site. If you go to the drip kit page or the tape page, you'll see a link there. Oh, it jumped mm -hmm. out of my hand. These don't cost you a dime. We didn't think it was fair to make you pay for something to have to use a different roll of tape. 
The way these work are really simple when you're using your... So you just click on a little box if you need those. Yeah, right under the description it says if you're using this with our drip tape layer attachment, get these axle spacers and they're, they're 0. 0. 0.00 cents. You add them to the That's cart. pretty cheap, 0. 0.00 yeah. cents. So the way these work is you just stick them into the sides of this roll here and then you have to pop one of them there. And then your drip tape axle goes in there. Everything works exactly as planned. Now, if you order our drip tape layer attachment or the drip tape layer combo, you're going to get these anyway. So you don't need to add these as well. They'll come with it. But if you're just ordering more tape to go on your drip tape layer, make sure you pick up these. They come as a pair. They don't cost you a dime. Just make sure you add them to the cart. Yep. <laughs> Easy peasy. All right. Anything else Ooh, with drip tape? I think I, we covered a lot there. I, th I feel like that was a, a good comprehensive. Mm. Um, Let's get to some analysis. questions. Let's get to some questions. First one comes from Patrick H. And he says, I see you're in Georgia. Are your seeds from Georgia? Also, do you source from all over? Do you source them from all over? I ordered seeds. I ordered this year's seeds from a place I found on Best Seeds Growing in the South page. Turns out they came from Oregon. Anywho, this fall and beyond is another story. I'd like to source my seeds from plants that grow in the South. Well, um, that's I got tough. Bad news for Patrick H. There's not a lot of seed growers in the South. And there's a reason behind that. <laughs> Same reason it's tough for us to grow stuff down here. Um, so I mentioned this before on the show. The seed trade is an international trade. Uh, seed crops are grown all over the world in Central America, South America, Europe, Asia, North America, pretty much everywhere. In the United States, the hot spot is Oregon and California. West Coast. West Coast, that area out there. They have a lot less humidity and a lot better climate for growing seed crops. Yeah. So there's not a lot that are grown in the South. A lot of people like to think, well, if I get something that was grown in the South, it's going to grow better here. That's a little bit of a misconception. I've talked about that before. It takes years to breed in that local um, adaptability or whatever. You know, the one thing that I'd say is southern peas is most of them are grown in Texas. Yeah. In the south. So. Now, now our, our owl squash and our Cherokee team pumpkin we have on our side, we did grow here. Yeah. Um, but most things are grown internationally or on the west coast. Yep. That's just the way it is. Number two is from Jeff Foster. He's talking about field peas. He said, can you eat the peas early with a shell on them or not? Yes, you can. So when we're shelling peas, which is an art within itself, if you've you never did, done you it. You said last week you don't shell peas. No, but I know how that's done. I coach it along. So when you're shelling them peas and you get them out and you come across one that maybe didn't mature out enough and it's not ready to be a shelling, what you do is you just stop what you're doing, take both ends off, and you snap it. That's the reason when you eat these peas, a lot of times they some snaps in there because that's some early peas that didn't mature out that you yeah. just snap up. That you put accidentally in. grab when you just grab uh -huh. a handful of peas when you was picking. Yeah. And if you ain't never seen that, you ain't never eaten no homemade shelled peas because that's always in your homemade shelled peas. You're going to see a few snaps in there. Well, Store-bought bags of peas won't have them in there. Nope. Nope. Just them homemade new kind, you know, that, yeah. you know what I'm talking about. All right. Now, next one is from Aaron P. He said, did you guys discontinue the Brazilian orchard pepper variety? Because when I click on the variety, it says the page didn't exist, or are you guys just out of stock at the moment? I wouldn't say discontinue. What I've been working on the last few days is taking some of these things, whether it be a seed variety or a tool or something that I know we're not going to be able to get for a long time, and just, and just taking it off the website temporarily. That way... It doesn't cause a lot of frustration for people hopping around the different things that are out of stock. So that was a great variety. I grew it myself, really liked it, but I haven't been able to source it in a little over a year. So I just temporarily took it off the website. It's still there. You just can't see it. I can put it back on if we find more seeds. Um, just doing that to kind of reduce some of the out of stock frustration out there. Mm -hmm. Number four is from ZW Trussell. That's a good name right there. Or oh, ZW. Great show tonight. Got a zipper peas in. Do you think that the Red Ripper pea is the same as red beans used to make red beans mm, and rice? No, I don't. I don't either. The red beans is a bean. Now, this is a pea. I want you to look at the size of these red rippers right there. If you can see, let me get it right here where y'all can see it real good. Y'all see that? It's kind of a small pea. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, this is a fine one right here. We, uh, I ain't grown none in about a year, but I've grown them. It's a small pea. It's a red pea. And it's a very aggressive vining pea. And if you want something to grow a little different, maybe you can't get them zipper peas or you want to try something a little different, this would be a good one to try. It's not a bean. It's a pea and it's smaller. And uh, one thing people don't know about these red rippers are they're extremely heat tolerant. Mm -hmm. Probably more heat tolerant than any other variety of the uh, southern peas. Also makes a great cover crop and a great plot for wildlife. So if you got one you want to grow out there for some deer, this would be a good one to grow out there. It grows like crazy. Give it plenty of room when you grow it. But there you get it, Red Ripper. I'm going to tell y'all what, y'all need to try it. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. It's a little different than your zippers, but it's definitely a good one to put on your... A little meatier taste to it. Nuttier. Yeah. Look, your repertoire. How about yeah. that? Put I'm going to grow, when some of my spring stuff is done and can't take the heat, I'm going to grow me a whole cover crop plot of them. If you've never grown peas before, it probably is the one you'd want to start with because it's hardy, heat tolerant, and forgiving. Mm -hmm. All right, the next one says, uh, it's from Leslie S. She says, do you think you could add ladies' teas or tanks to your merchandise? I guess when she says ladies' teas, she's talking about like V-necks that look better on the women folk. Um, they look pretty good on me. Yeah. Yeah. As far as the tanks go, uh, I do want to add some tanks. I can I can rock a tank. I can too. Sun's out, guns mm -hmm. out. That's what they say. You just kind of roll yep. them up like that. Yep. Ready to go. Um, I do want to add some tank tops. Probably do that pretty soon because it's getting hot. If any of y'all would like to see uh, us have some tank tops, let us know in the comments below, and uh, we'll add some of those. Mm -hmm. Number six is from Karen Zorn, and she says, should you use inoculate when planting snow peas and purple holes? Well, to add the inoculate, you don't necessarily need it if they've been grown there before in the past. If you got a garden which you've grown peas or beans there for a while, it's not a necessity. However, if it's a new garden spot or you're a little iffy about it, you can always add it in there. There's not much cost to it, and you're not hurting anything by adding it if you don't need it. So you can add it, but if you got a garden spot that you plant beans or peas on in, in the past, I think you could probably get by with that. It's a good insurance policy to have. Yeah, a little shaker can. I think it's 12 bucks, and it does 150 row feet. Yeah, and supposedly if uh, it does add some increases to your yields there. Hmm. So there you have it. Next one's for... From Billy Richardson, he says, do you think that wasps on a heavy aphid diet and while having heavy blooms on field peas, purple holes, that they'll go into a trance? I grew them a while back and was picking wild, loaded, and the wasps never stung me. Well, mm. preface this, a, a little bit of experience with this. I don't have any wasps around my house. Really? No, around my house, we have wasps. Wasps, yeah. Uh, I, I've yet to see a wasp, but I have gotten torn up by the wasps mm -hmm. uh, quite a few times. Now, Billy sounds like he has figured out a way to hypnotize his wasps, mm -hmm. uh, which I, I commend him on that because I have yet to see I that. will get stung every now and then. I will, within my barn, I go through there looking pretty regularly, but underneath the kid's slide or underneath my tater storage rack, about once or twice a year, I'm going to get tattooed about four or five times mm -hmm. and, and go to cussing and running and hollering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, my wasps aren't forgiven. Mm -mm. No, especially when I'm gathering stuff. Uh, sunflowers, sometimes a bumblebee hit me when I'm getting some of my flowers. But uh, every now and then I'll get hung out by a wasp, reach around and grab something, uh, that pea vine, whatever, and he'll, he'll tattoo you on the other side. So do they go in a trance? Mm -hmm. Not here. I ain't never seen a wasp go in a trance. Yep. Last one's from Wandering Williams. So you just got some zipper peas. Uh, I talked about planting on double rows. How far apart would you plant them in one of them four foot wide raised beds? So this is what I would do. I would come off one side one foot and I would come off the other side one foot and I'd plant me two rows down through there. That would give you two foot in the middle, give them plenty of room to be grow. Hanging over the side. Be hanging over the side, just go ahead and grab a wall. Two rows, a foot off of the end, and leave you two foot in the middle. And there you have it. Good deal. Before we go, my plethora of onions. Some of these are going to seed. These two wasn't. Um, that's I, nice. That's what we're going for right there. Now, there's been folks that's come by here that's dropped off bigger onions than that, and I, I give them credit where credit's due. But that's what I'm going for right yep. there. 
That's, uh, that's a nice onion. That's what we're going for. Now, this one here. That's a twin. I ain't ever seen this happen. This one got so big, it had to sp split in two. Mm -hmm. uh, made a double onion there. So they getting, the stem's getting a little weak on them. They ain't quite falling over yet. This was the first ones I planted in back in late October. and uh, But they're going, I had a fella on Facebook or somewhere message me. He said, I planted my onions back in November like y'all did. And they just starting to grow. I don't believe they're going to be ready till May. Does it normally take them that long? So, yeah, when you overwinter them, it does. Yeah, you just it takes a while. A patience yep. Them, but, uh, that's our onions there. Hope everybody um, enjoyed the drip irrigation discussion. If you have any more questions on drip irrigation that we didn't cover, definitely put those in the comments below, and we'll try to answer them for you. Good deal. I'll put some links below to all the products we talked about on tonight's video so you can head on over to our website and check those out. If you enjoyed tonight's show, make sure to give us a big thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and ring that little bell so you get notified every time we come out with a new video. And if you did enjoy tonight's video, make sure you check out these other two videos right here, ones we did in the past on drip irrigation as well. Make sure you check those out. We'll see you next time.